So first of all, this is a little bit of an experiment. Uh, it's the first time actually I'm using my Qualcomm ARM tablet running Windows 10, and attached to it is that Lenaro HDMI dongle. So if anything goes wrong, I'll blame it on the dongle. So uh, with that, um, I want to talk a little bit about how we run Azure. Azure is the second largest cloud in the world. And as you probably heard, we're doing quite a lot of things with ARM. And so I want to talk a little bit about that as well. I want to talk about how that is relevant to ARM, what we're doing, what kind of things we're building, hardware platform, software, but also talk a little bit about the challenges. So Azure um, is a humongous set of, uh, of servers across the whole world. One of the really differentiating things in Azure is that we go where our customers are. And we do that for a few reasons. We do that obviously for uh, performance reasons, bandwidth reasons, latency reasons, but we're also doing that for regulatory compliance reasons. There are lots of reasons, for example, when you have customer data in Europe, you're not allowed to move that customer data out of Europe. Again, it's a reason for us to have data centers there. We call these, reg we call these combinations of data centers regions uh, every region has at least two data centers, and we do that for failover, so we can basically lose a data center and still continue operations on the other one. Um, and we currently have regions in every continent of the world except for Antarctica. Um, we're growing like gangbusters. So I think last year we doubled our infrastructure, doubled the number of servers, we doubled our revenue. And to give you an idea of that, I'm going to show you two pictures. So here is a bird's eye view of a data center in Virginia. Uh, here you're seeing two data centers, uh, various generations. Um, but if you look at those trucks, you get an idea of how big these things are. Um, this happens to be a, a site where we actually run one of our government data centers. We actually, one of the things we do, if you're a large enough customer, we'll actually build a special purpose data center for you. And as you can imagine, it's typically governments that like to do that. We do that in the UK, we do it in Germany. Uh, and so obviously we've got some special restrictions around that as well, we can get into those data centers. But to give you an idea of how much we've been growing, so that picture that you saw on the previous slide is that blurb that is on the top. Right? Since then, we've built a new data center. Um, and we've clearly broken a lot of ground for the rest of the growth. Um, and that data center that you see there right at the top, that's actually our standard format that we nowadays use. Um, there are four buildings um, interconnected with an enormous amount of fiber. Uh, basically projected for, uh, for, for network bandwidth for the next 20 years, because that's typically how long these things last. Um, and we provide, just to give you an idea, 40 gigabytes at this point, we provide 40 gigabytes between any server to any server in those four buildings. Right? So that's sort of the speeds and feeds that we're driving. And clearly, this is growing like gangbusters, and this is one of many data centers that we have around the world. I think at this point, we're probably around well over 150 data centers in the world and growing. So we've been in this data center game for a long time, almost 30 years. And so we started off back in the early 90s with building standard infrastructure. So you put up a 19-inch rack, you build individual servers from vendors, uh, you wire them up to a network. It's basically a hotspot of things, right? Uh, so they're very labor intensive. They're not particularly efficient. So the metric that you see at the top of this uh, uh, blob, PUE, stands for power utilization efficiency. It's a number that was coined by the Green Grid Computing uh, Organization. And what that is, is it represents the total power that you spend on a data center divided by the amount of power that you spend on billable, uh, uh, billable uh, hardware or billable components. So this is your computer, this is your networking, that kind of stuff, but it doesn't include things like your air conditioning or other kind of other cooling mechanisms that you have or backup power, those kinds of things. So clearly a factor of two is quite expensive. So one of the things you'll see over the next couple of blobs is that we're actually reducing that to a much, much smaller number. So in 2007, we really started to do this in earnest. Um, and what we started to do really is build custom design, custom uh, racks, 
standard servers, but in custom racks, we would all pre-configure them, and we would very much focus on driving the cost down and really getting more density out of it, getting more and more scale. And by the way, one thing I want to point out is that with all of these steps, we grew. And it's kind of interesting that in the data center, someone told me that if you go to medical school, half of the things you learn in school, right, will be proven wrong by the time you're at the end of your career. And pretty much the same is true for building a cloud data center as well. Because you get new insights when you go from 100,000 to a half a million nodes, when you go from a half a million to a million, and so on, when you go to two million and beyond, there are constantly new things that you learn, and we're constantly experimenting things and changing things. So second generation is very much focused on density. How do we pack as much as we can? The third generation is actually where we introduced zones. Uh, so we had cold aisles and hot aisles. So you've got cold aisles, that's where the cold air comes in. You would suck it through the machines, through the nodes, and then you would have a hot aisle where you would exhaust it out. Um, and one of the things, for example, that we do is we actually have all the I.O. be on the front end of the machine so that the operators actually are in the cold aisle while working on that. Because those hot aisles can get pretty hot indeed. And so you don't really want people to work in that. Uh, you'll be sweating like a pig if you're there. Uh, that clearly induced the efficiently a lot. We went actually to 1.2 and 1.5. We then started looking at pods. So one of the challenges that we have is in building data centers is that it's, you build a building, you put it full of machines, but you need to get an occupancy license for it, even though there are hardly any people in those data centers. Uh, you still need to make sure that people can actually get into that building and it's safe for that. Uh, and it can quite easily take six months or more to get that license. So as we're growing quickly, right, we're building these data centers, we then have to wait six months to go and uh, get that occupancy license. So what we started doing instead is building pots or containers. So these are literally, the first one was literally a shipping container, and we put it full with servers, and there were basically three inputs, cold water, power, and networking, and that was it. And in Chicago, one of our data centers there, we literally put these things out on a field, wired them up, and we were up and running. The problem, of course, with these kinds of pods is that maintenance isn't that great where it's difficult. You don't have a lot of space to work in. Uh, they tend to be very dense. So with the sixth generation or the fifth generation, we actually went back into our data centers. But we did focus very much on software defined. So we built smart NICs, uh, pushed a lot of the complexity out into those kind of devices. That again drove the PoE higher or lower, um, so more efficiency. And now we're actually on the sixth generation. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. So but before I continue with that, let me talk a little bit about what our ARM server approach is. So last year, we actually publicly stated that we are evaluating ARM for use in our data center. Uh, and we're still evaluating ARM. Uh, there's actually a lot of efforts uh, around it. There's a lot of software that need to be ported before you can operationalize that. Um, but the reason we're doing this uh, is somewhat confusing people. I always still get requests or still questions from, uh, from journalists is like, ah, you're only doing that to drive down the cost, which isn't actually the reason. Uh, if it was cost, we would actually just stick with the suppliers that we have. The problem is that we have only one supplier. And so given the rate that we're growing, right, if that supplier ever has a hiccup or anything or any other kind of challenge, we cannot grow, and that's the situation that we want to get out of. This is not about cost. In fact, if you look at ARM servers, they're probably over time are going to be more expensive than other servers out there because they're just a, it's just a function of scale. Right? On the ARM side, the scale isn't there, so designing a motherboard, building a motherboard is going to be more expensive than building a motherboard for the commodity part or the high scale part. Um, so the main reason for us actually is supply chain reasons. We want optionality. We want to be able to continue to grow. We do not want to be blocked growing because we're dependent on a single supplier and that supplier has an issue. Um, 
We're also doing it because we want to take advantage of innovation, and we want to actually see more innovation in the server space. And we think that ARM is a much better ecosystem to go and drive that than anywhere else. Um, and obviously, it also helps that we do have things like client builds, Windows client, which is still what a lot of other applications depend on. So it's a much easier porting effort for us than anything else. So we're also interested in creating a healthy ecosystem. We're not interested in one ARM server player. Uh, we're interested in multiple ARM server players. So we're working currently with three. Two of them have been public, Qualcomm and Cavium. Um, and we actually, uh, there's a third one who really wants to remain uh, anonymous at this point, although probably most people in this room know who they are. Um, and then there is actually a, a other ones that we have enabled too. I mean, ARM, for example, on the things they're doing are running uh, Windows Server. Ampere actually just showed this week at OCP Summit back in, uh, in, uh, in Santa Clara that they're running Windows Server. Um, so we are interested in Windows Server, but we've only been doing that for internal use. And that is another thing that I've gotten a lot of questions over. The reason for that is where we see the opportunity. Right? Taking on and building an operating system and providing a 10-year life guarantee for that is quite a commitment. Now, if we look at this market, right, we see a growth on cloud, tremendous growth, growth on cloud. The CAGR is around 40%. Um, if we look at enterprise, standard enterprise, there is basically no growth. It's a stabilized market. So from our point of view, the opportunity isn't in enterprise. Right? Moving a stabilized market to a different architecture is extremely difficult and expensive. And we just, for now, we don't see the opportunity. Now, obviously, if that market would ever to materialize, we have the capabilities. But for this point, at this point, we're not doing a retail version of Windows Server. We're only focused on our internal applications. Um, the key focus is on internal cloud applications. And with that, I mean applications like search. Uh, um, you can think of it as SQL services, all those kinds of things that where we actually control the stack and it doesn't expose uh, the x86-ness right, that you see in VMs. So the traditional VM hosting business is not something that we're seeing going to ARM anytime soon unless there is an ecosystem around that that builds up. But without that ecosystem, we're just focused on the internal applications. We're also developing hardware. Uh, one of the things we do is we actually build our own servers. We do that for cost reasons. We do that for quality reasons. And so we're doing the same thing in the ARM space. And I'll show you some pictures of it later on. So where do we see the opportunities? Well, I already mentioned search and indexing. Um, we got a lot of servers devoted to that. High performance storage is an obvious candidate because again, the stack is what we control. Uh, there are no user applications running. There are no user VMs running. Uh, it's all our own code. Uh, machine and big learning obviously is a, taking up a larger and larger percentage of our data center capacity and so on. Um, platform as a service, again, anywhere where the ISA doesn't shine through, right? Um, is actually a good candidate for ARM servers. And when I talk about ARM servers, the ones I'm working with are building high-end, high-performance servers, because that's what I'm interested in. I'm not interested in, in putting a bunch of A53, Cortex-A53 together, because that's not sufficient for my workloads. Most of my workloads still benefit from single-threaded performance improvements. Now, if you add all these properties up, it turns out that's well over 50% of my data center capacity. So there is actually a very good opportunity for ARM servers. Now, obviously, there needs to be a value proposition, right? So uh, that, I think, is the one that we are still having challenges with. So here's an example of what we have done, and I'm sort of focusing on Windows Server that we're running. Uh, the pictures that you actually see here on the side are Task Manager running on a Cavium box, a Cavium 2P box. And the only reason I'm showing that is because it's sort of cool to show up 256 hardware threads executing. Uh, but obviously, we have similar kind of things on other hardware platforms running. Uh, we do have Windows Server builds, again, for internal use. Uh, both core and full is what we're building. We actually have the full compiler support. That's actually part of Visual Studio 17 um, that you can actually download, and you can use it on those client systems as well. Uh, we're integrating Hyper-V. We actually have 
over 500 ARM servers in, uh, in Microsoft for our internal developers. So that's what we're using to develop performance testing, all sorts of kind of things that we're doing with that. Um, in fact, we've got so many ARM servers that we're even surplusing some of the ARM servers right now because they're too old uh, and too not very powerful. Um, and we have got, of that list that I just showed, a number of those properties uh, are actually evaluating ARM server. So what's still missing? Um, a lot of performance optimizations, right? The thing that the benefit of the x86 ecosystem is that you've got about 30, 40 years of performance optimizations, both in the compiler and libraries and other parts of the system. We're missing that on the ARM side, and we're definitely seeing that. Um, the other thing where ARM is actually running ahead uh, of some of the x86 architectures is the high core count and the interesting NUMA properties that come with that. Once you start running 256 uh, threads on a single box, hardware threads, um, there are very interesting things that happen in the OS. Uh, Windows definitely has its share of, uh, of issues in the scheduler and stuff like that. Uh, my understanding is that Linux has a lot of the same kind of issues. Um, so it's kind of interesting that we're with ARM platforms running into that first. Okay, Project Olympus. So Project Olympus is a hardware project and it's a, think of it as a modular approach of how we build hardware. So we build our own hardware in Microsoft for cost reasons, for reliability reasons, for support reasons. Um, we really like as much uniformity as possible. Um, and so we built standard chassis and that goes a pretty standard motherboard. Um, yeah, we put some other things on it, but in overall, it's a standard size motherboard. Um, and the way we really differentiate a lot is actually in the power supply. So when you're in every continent of the world, one of the biggest challenges is actually get power in all those servers and do it in such a way that you can build one SKU of servers and deploy them everywhere. And so the way we've done that is we've actually built a special power supply. It gets three phases of input. And really the only thing we change, these racks go everywhere around the world. The only thing that we change are the power connectors that you see on the upper uh, right side there. Um, the nice thing about this modular architecture is that for ARM, I only have to focus on building motherboards. Right? I do not have to build an entire server. It's one thing to figure out how do I get ARM into Azure. It's another thing if I had to build standard servers with that that I would wire up to everything and has all our secret sauce in it and that kind of stuff. I don't have to deal with that, right? I built a motherboard. And those motherboards we've been building, we've been building three. Um, we have one with uh, Foxconn and Cavium. We built an earlier one with Inventec. And we've also been working closely with Qualcomm, uh, as you saw with all the announcements in early 17. Um, and again, the nice thing about these motherboards is they just slot into our standard machine, so it just fits in our standard deployment model. They're the same size, the same configuration, roughly. Um, so our operational people know how to deal with this. So let me talk about some of the challenges in the ARM ecosystem. Um, I know you guys, as an organization, have worked on this a lot, uh, but standards are an absolute requirement for uh, ARM64 adoption at scale. Uh, and it's also an ongoing dialogue. It's not something that you've done once and you sort of stuck because there are new things that we learn. And there are, like for example, recently ACPI introduced something called the PPTT table. It's a new way to describe NUMA nodes and how caches relate to everything. This is how operating systems optimize things. Um, this was actually driven by the ARM folks and we actually are, using this, or planning to use this, on the x86 side too, because we see a lot of the same challenges that the ARM systems are sort of running ahead with on the x86 side as well. Uh, but that standardization is absolutely critical. Um, hyperscale is about increasing scale and reducing complexity. Right? When you've got very complex solutions, time scale, that doesn't work at all. So we simplify things a lot. Again, that's why we build our own systems. And that's both from a technology, technology point of view as well as a supply chain. So you'll have to, you, you see me speaking out very publicly around things like OpenBMC, things as uh, UE80K2. Um, 
because when I deal with my partners, if I have to add a third one to it or a fourth one to it, like an IBV, right, it increases the complexity for me to manage all of this. Um, sticking to the standards that we already know and love, well, love perhaps not for everybody, but definitely know and support, that reduces the friction, it reduces the barrier to entry. Um, and one thing that has been quite complicated for the ARM ecosystem um, is that, frankly, hardware bugs and non-standard design are not my problem, right? That's why I'm developing multiple. And if you've got a hardware bug, you fix your design. Uh, I'm not gonna change my operating system because I can deal with having multiple hardware fixes or hardware workarounds in my operating system. And that has literally happened. I have forced partners of mine to do an entirely new spin out, a tape out of their part and put some new major functionality in it quite late in the game because they were non-standard. <laughs> so, still, there are a lot of business challenges. Um, so we're sort of at this interesting spot where we're finally seeing capable ARM servers, definitely sort of at the Broadwell level, and hopefully next year we're gonna see some better ones that are even getting higher than where the other competition is. But unfortunately, there's also a lot of server fatigue in the industry, right? When I go and talk to, I spend a lot of time talking to my fellow cloud vendors, or my fellow cloud partners, because yeah, we're competitors, but you know what? There are also areas where we're also looking for uh, collaboration, because in the end, we're interested in commoditizing things, like for example, hardware, right? We all benefit from scale. Um, and some of these companies have been experimenting with ARM for over 10 years and they started out with 32-bit processors, um, and it didn't cut it for their workloads. Uh, and so their senior management remembers that. Right? And so you have to overcome a hurdle with them, which is quite challenging. Um, I still get a lot of complaints that there are no ecosystem uh, that provides turnkey solutions. Again, I talked to a second-tier cloud provider here in China uh, in last November, and they said, yeah, workload-wise, the performance is there. It could, so it's sufficient for our needs. But we just, we pull down apps and we try to compile them. It doesn't compile, right? Or we need this particular component and there is no ARM version for that. So I think that's sort of our next challenge to get that level of, uh, of, of, of support in there. Now, from my perspective, I go after applications that I control, right? And even that is a challenge because Microsoft has a lot of code. Right? And so things like we're on the x86 side, we have optimized encryption algorithms, optimized CRC checksums. None of that stuff exists on ARM. So that's where a lot of our effort is going. Um, the other challenge is still there. There's a lot of consolidation happening in the semiconductor space. And that actually is making the ARM server future pretty uncertain at this point. Okay, so let me summarize. So I think that as an ecosystem, we've made good progress, both on the hardware and the software front. Um, as I said, we've been driving hardware vendors to make changes to it. There's been an enormous amount of enablement on the Linux side, largely through this organization, to go and standardize that. Um, and those standards are paying off. Just to give you an example, all the ARM partners I've worked with so far, we always required some fairly deep debugging um, both in uh, the windows to go and figure out firmware bugs, or in some cases do some windows workarounds, although I earlier said we don't really do them. Obviously, it's not entirely a black and white story. Uh, but all of them, we had to do something special with them and work with them and get things to fix. Um, last year, Ampere came to me. Uh, at that point, they were still APM, and they said, we want to run windows. And I said, look, I have not unable to support you, right? I've got already my hands full with my team. I can't take you on. I'm happy to give you access to the binaries, but you're on your own. And so they went away. They came back six months later and they said, we think there is a bug in Windows because uh, we can't boot from SADA uh, or the direct attached SADA, which is the SADA attached to the AXI interface. And I said, nope, it works on other systems. Literally, that was the only thing I said. It works on other systems just fine. And they went away, came back the next day and said, yep, we found the problem. It was in the firmware, we fixed it, and they brought it up. They were the first ARM server partner that brought up Windows without any of our help, 
which is a big deal, because unlike Linux, where you can look into the source code, or you can modify the source code to make it work, because I've seen it a lot too, with Windows, you just get the binaries, and you don't get to change anything, and you don't get to look into the source code. So I think that's a testament for the standardization efforts that you guys have been driving, and they're actually paying off. So from a Microsoft Azure perspective, we're maturing. Uh, we're focused, obviously, on targeted applications, uh, OS, tooling, workloads, that kind of stuff, uh, as well as the hardware designs. Um, there is sort of an interesting stage at this point, since Microsoft has been the first one, and so far the only one to go public on ARM servers. All of Wall Street is looking at me to make this thing a reality. So really my focus is on deployment inside of Azure, and I'm not gonna make any statements about that here, by the way. Um, but as I said, those business challenges still remain. So I don't know whether we've got time for questions. I think we can take a couple of questions. Really fascinating stuff. Do you have a hand mic that we could use maybe? Great. Anyone? I really? Not, okay, why don't we start right over here. So when you see the, um, uh, there is a reason of supply chain, so how do you see the AMD source? Oh, AMD is very much part of our strategy as well. Right, but what we're after is optionality. Right, the challenge a little bit on betting on an ecosystem with a duopoly with only two players, where one can outspend the other significantly, right, creates lots of business risk as well. Now, on the other hand, AMD is much easier for us to adopt because there is no software hurdle. Right, so but they're definitely part of our strategy as well. So we have a multi-pronged strategy that includes both. And don't forget, Intel is our biggest partner, right? We work very, very closely with Intel, and they've been a very good partner to us, and we'll continue to work a lot with them. So it's not like we're actively trying to get rid of Intel. It's just that from a business perspective, right, for us to grow, we need optionality. So. Others? Really? Okay, right down the center. There are no more questions. Um, I just want to have a little bit of a shameless plug. Uh, at 2 o'clock uh, today, there is a panel where Linder is uh, going to be part of with some other uh, folks from the industry that are well known in this crowd. Come on down, ask these questions, think of questions, and we'll be happy to uh, host you there. Right. Do you think Microsoft would participate in the consolidation within the industry? So, I'm sorry, I think you had a lot to drink last night, so I'm not quite sure. <laughs> not enough. Um, yeah, do you think Microsoft would participate in the industry consolidation um, as a way of potentially protecting itself and its investments? Um, well, that depends on how it plays out, right? I, I'm not really going to comment on that here. Um, but. We definitely have the ability to do that. It, the real question is, does it make sense for us to do that? Right? I think on ARM, what we want to see is an ecosystem with multiple players. That's why we're enabling more than one. We are expecting to see some consolidation. Um, I think what we're seeing today is a little bit more than we had anticipated. So I'd like to leave it at that. So. I think we have time for one more. Anybody? OK. Okay. Leander, thank, thank you so much for joining us. That was, that was really interesting and insightful. Okay. Please join me in welcoming Tomas Evanson, who is the CTO for Embedded at Xilinx, and he's going to share all sorts of interesting insight with us about FPGAs. Welcome, Tomas.